Well, um, dialogue. Yeah, again, <laughs> welcome everyone on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and the IV to this informal dialogue on the climate change human rights nexus. Um, we are very happy to have you all here to discuss more closely what does it actually mean, this human rights climate change nexus. The relationship between human rights and climate change receives increasing attention, particularly since the UN General Assembly resolution, which declared a healthy environment to human rights. So what does it actually mean for companies? We want also to better understand how employers federation can support their company members in uh, meeting the expectation and the request of stakeholders in this regard. Other process we see is at the OECD level, the update of the OECD guidelines foresee at the moment also a much better or um, closer linkage between human rights and environmental rights. And we see it also within the EU due diligence legislation. So there are a lot of developments at the moment where companies need to react to and we prepare a guidance together with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and the IE for this purpose. The idea of this um, workshop is to get your input, your ideas, and also your priorities with that regard, so that we can then finalize this document, which would be then be released at the beginning of the year. So I will not talk much more, just to say that we have interpretation into English-Spanish. So if you want to listen to Spanish, please, at the bottom, you have, as always, the interpretation button. Because of interpretation, I also would like to ask you to speak very slowly so that the interpreters can actually do their job properly and um, do the interpretation. We have a lot of very high level people with us and I will greet them as we go through the agenda. But first of all, I really would like to give the floor to Andrea um, Ostheimer, who is the Managing Director of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in New York. And they have been a very close partner to IV on many, many different activities, but also on business and human rights. So over to you, Andrea. Thank you so much, Matthias, for your kind introduction. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you today to this CAS IOE dialogue on the climate change human rights nexus. For us as CAS, the motivation to put this topic high on the agenda is manifold. For a political foundation that supports democracy and human rights through its over 100 offices worldwide, it is paramount that human rights are universal and they are the rights of the individual. In our climate change and energy security programs in Europe, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia and the Middle East, we are trying to seek solutions in addressing climate change with a multi-stakeholder approach. And the nexus of business and human rights <clears throat> equally features in our regional uh, rule of law programs, for example. And lastly, we are also a strong supporter and advocate for a social market economy where social protection systems are in place, subsidiarity matters, and both government as well as employers uh, have the, responsible, uh, the responsibility to, to work together. Um, ladies and gentlemen, when UN Secretary General um, Antonio Guterres engaged global investors in 2019 and they formed the Global Investors Alliance for Sustainable Development, the CEO of the Al Allianz, uh, the German insurer, um, the CEO Oliver Betke said, we could do so much more if politics would provide us with the necessary frameworks. And just a week ago, I received an inv invitation from Citibank here in the US for an exchange on the question, can mid-sized companies lead the way to a sustainable future? And definitely the answer is yes. Uh, mid-sized companies with a bold vision can play a vital role in helping the world transition to a sustainable and inclusive future. Um, focusing on sustainability is critical. It can help you to grow efficiently, be resilient, engage employees, improve value, and also investor appetite. It is not easy, but the benefits are huge if you have the right strategy and commitment, but you also need a predictable legal framework. You need the right financial solutions. 
Um, in all of this, governments are key to encourage and to stimulate the transition to mitigate and also to protect human rights. Um, coming back um, also to what kind of role could Konrad Adenauer Stiftung play in support uh, of business in addressing the new challenges that come with climate change and how can we as a political foundation contribute to the protection of human rights? I would say first and foremost, we as a globally engaged foundation, we are a platform and at the same time we are a convener. We bring state and non-state actors, government, civil society and the private sector together. We draw attention to pertinent issues in our societies and we also allow for an exchange of best practices across the regions and continents. So we have a wide multi-stakeholder network that also allows us to bring in multiple perspectives, uh, generating an understanding for the needs, but also allowing to advocate for further engagement. So I hope that today's discussion will be one of this kind and we can walk out of this virtual room, not only with new arguments and a very sound problem analysis, but also with best practices, how we can overcome the challenges. So thank you very much. Uh, Thomas, uh, Matthias um, and IOE for the opportunity to continue this exchange on business, human rights and climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andre, and really thank you for your leadership on this issue which you're taking in New York, but also beyond New York. It's really appreciated. I would like to turn now to Fernanda Hoppenheim. Fernanda Hoppenheim is the chair of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. We really appreciate, Fernanda, that you are here. You had a very, very busy time. We had the UN Forum on Business and Human Rights just the week before. So thank you so much for coming. The UN Working Group has just released guidance, I think, some months ago on this topic. So if you could just give us your perspective and the perspective of the UN Working Group on this important topic. Over to you, Fernanda. Thank you very much, Matias. As per usual, I'll be speaking in Spanish, so if you need to switch on the interpretation. Buenos días, buenas tardes a todas y todos. Es un gusto estar aquí. Gracias a la CAS y a la IOI por la invitación. Um, y como bien comentaba Matías, este es un tema fundamental para el Grupo de Trabajo de Empresas y Derechos Humanos de Naciones Unidas. Por supuesto, la crisis climática es una de las mayores crisis que estamos enfrentando y requiere acciones urgentes. Eh, es, un, es clave que cualquier abordaje en materia de cambio climático tenga eh, este componente de derechos humanos justamente por los grandes impactos a los derechos humanos de esta crisis climática. Los principios rectores de empresas y derechos humanos de Naciones Unidas, por supuesto, incluyen todos los derechos y prevenir el daño o cualquier impacto negativo a derechos humanos implica, por supuesto, tomar medidas para abordar los impactos de la crisis climática. Eh, la debida diligencia en materia de, de derechos humanos, de acuerdo a los principios rectores, incluye, por supuesto, todos los derechos, los derechos ambientales <coughs> y cuestiones vinculadas a la crisis climática también estarían contenidas, o nuestra recomendación sería que cuando las empresas establezcan procesos de debida diligencia, estos esfuerzos incluyan la perspectiva de la justicia climática. <coughs> Perdón, el grupo de trabajo eh, ha estado trabajando justamente en desarrollar algunas guías basadas en los principios rectores eh, con respecto al tema del cambio climático, en el foro que acabamos de terminar la semana pasada, eh, discutimos, tuvimos una sesión sobre este tema, y esperamos seguir siendo una fuente de consulta y de guía y de opiniones este, que ojalá sean útiles para toda esta comunidad de práctica en materia de derechos humanos y eh, cambio climático o la crisis climática. Creemos que realmente cualquier esfuerzo hacia una transición justa, por supuesto que debe incluir el tema de derechos humanos, esto se vio en la COP27 con bastante más fuerza. Hay distintos actores de todos los sectores eh, trabajando porque se incluya la perspectiva de derechos humanos en las discusiones sobre cambio climático, que se trascienda la discusión puramente técnica en cuanto a números de, o datos de emisiones, por ejemplo, y eh, se aborden los impactos a las personas y a las comunidades en sus derechos como parte de esta crisis que estamos viviendo 
todos en esta sociedad. Y yo creo que la recomendación del grupo de trabajo es que eh, cualquier esfuerzo por parte de las empresas de abordar temas de cambio climático, de trabajar sus impactos ambientales para reducir justamente las contribuciones a esta crisis, tengan esta perspectiva de los derechos humanos. Los principios rectores entonces creo que son la mejor guía para las empresas, para el sector privado, para abordar este tema, incluir estos componentes en la debida diligencia y eh, bueno, creo que hay varios esfuerzos incluyendo la propia IOI tiene unas guías para sus asociados en materia de crisis eh, o de cambio climático y nos parece que hacer esas conexiones es fundamental. Por eso este va a seguir siendo un tema de trabajo central para el grupo de trabajo. Eh, vamos a seguir incluyéndolo en nuestros eventos y discusiones, pero también ir elaborando guías que permitan clarificar esta conexión entre los principios rectores y cualquier abordaje en materia de cambio climático, con el fin de que sea más claro y más, más sencillo y más directo para todos los actores implicados. Entonces, pues agradezco mucho, celebro esta, este encuentro y este diálogo que va a suceder ahora y pues, como siempre el grupo de trabajo queda a disposición para conversar y seguir eh, discutiendo estos temas tan importantes. Muchísimas gracias Matías, también a la, a la CAS y a todas las personas participantes. Thank you, Fernanda. That was really helpful. And we're really looking forward to continuing engaging with you. I have here problems with my interpretation. Sorry. Um, we're really looking forward um, to continue working with you on that. And indeed, you said there is already one guidance out from the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and the IE. And now we want to deepen this work, particularly in view of the resolution of the UN General Assembly. I'm more than happy now to introduce Brent Wilton. Most of you know Brent Wilton. He is really one of the well-known experts on this topic worldwide. He was the Secretary General of the IV. He then became the human rights lead in the Coca-Cola company. He was co-chairing the Center for Sports and Human Rights. And basically, if there's one person who knows about the topic, then it is him. So Brent will give us an introduction into the topic before we then kick off to the other experts. Over to you, Brent. Thank you, Matthias, and thank you also, Andrea from CAS, for the opportunity to participate in this session today. And thank you, Matthias, for your kind words. I think expert is a, a term which is used, uh, loosely used and not necessarily always warranted, but I, I do appreciate the confidence. Monique, if you can go on to the first uh, slide for me, please. So you're all aware of what the statement is from the General Assembly calls on states, business enterprises, and other relevant stakeholders to adopt policies to enhance international cooperation, strengthen capacity building, and continue to share good practice to scale up efforts to ensure a clean and healthy and sustainable environment for all. And as Andrea said, this is multi-stakeholder based. It's looking for collaboration. It's not looking to pass the buck onto any particular stakeholder group. And I think that's very important in the way in which business looks to respond to what this new resolution calls upon them to do. Thank you, Monique. But you know, like anything that's new, there's still uncertainty uh, and it will take some while for that certainty to emerge. And I think the work that the UN Human Rights Working Group is doing in this regard will be important to help do that. But there's still no global consensus on what the language of a safe and healthy environment actually is. And it may be you know, that individual states may do different things in different ways as they look to find ways forward in terms of addressing this new language. And if we've seen that in the past in the way in which states regard statements from the UN in terms of their own constitutions, et cetera. You'll also see that civil society and courts in some jurisdictions will start to get active. Uh, there's no doubt about that now. Uh, it will be used as a tool in a number of debates and litigation as a means of augmenting possible penalties or responsibilities. And that again will create uncertainty. Uh, there's a saying that human rights rarely survives the courts. And I think we have to be mindful of the fact that judicial interpretation of language which is vague and uncertain could create some challenges 
if business is not at the table to advise and to help people get some consistency around language. How it will impact other UN agencies and the wider multilateral system. I mean, this is a call to other relevant stakeholders, but what does that actually mean in terms of how other UN agencies, including the ILO, may decide to act in this regard, as well as the likes of WTO and others? That again has yet to be seen. And how would it feed into the UNGP and the OECD, the OECD guidelines and the NCP processes if complaints are raised? How will that happen? And I think the work, again, that's being done by the UN Human Rights Working Group and also the IOE New Center on Human Rights will be an important avenue through which those sorts of dialogues can start to occur and those sorts of impacts identified. Then the, the issue is raised already, and Andrea said she's off to talk to Citibank and Alliance and others are very active in this space. And it is true that a lot of companies now are seeing banks and insurance companies as the main driver for their sustainability and human rights work, because they are placing fair amounts of conditionality now on access to finance with regards to some of these issues. So how will the issue of climate change and a safe and healthy environment feed into that debate and discussion. Thank you, Monique. Also, again, and Andrea and others have mentioned this already, that there is a broader context going on. Uh, this is not happening in isolation. Um, the climate change debate through the COP process is very much first and foremost in people's minds, given the recent summit. But that debate is also occurring at different levels within societies and within government policy. I know here in New Zealand, the whole issue of climate change as it affects our agricultural sector is quite divisive and quite difficult to deal with because of the, the, the need to address uh, CO2 emissions. The litigation, which I've mentioned before, uh, as being an area where this may emerge as being an important uh, tool for people taking claims against business or even against governments. The UNFCC proposed global pact on the environment will also impact on this. The ongoing negotiation of the Business and Human Rights Treaty could well also shape some of this. We're seeing the EHRDD initiative out of the EU, which has already incorporated the issue of environment into human rights due diligence as an expectation on business. And of course, now there is a need for companies' own HRDD efforts and risk assessments to start to think about how do they include this new right in the work they do going forward, but also to revisit what they've already done in order to ensure that they are looking at to consider a safe and healthy environment in terms of the impacts. So again, this constant change is a reality in human rights. And this area is never going to be static, Monique. But just briefly, I think, and this is important, uh, we shouldn't wait as business. I think we need to be on the front foot in this discussion. I think there is an important role for both the IOE at the international level, but also within national employer organizations to assist their members and to engage with governments. I think we need to make sure that business is in the debates wherever they happen, whenever they happen. We should not give any ground to other louder stakeholders who may try and impose a definition and an application which is contrary to the intent behind the actual resolution, but also detrimental to business. So that proactivity is important. We need to be thinking more of a joined up approach now across human rights. I think that has been emerging and the UN Human Rights Working Group has been seeing this and promoting this, that human rights cannot be looked at in silos, that you need to take a landscape approach across the issues and risks that your business may pose to people and consider those risks now with the additional lens of a safe and healthy environment just as companies now need to look at their impacts with regards to the newly elaborated right within the um, ILO 1998 Declaration on Health and Safety. 
So how do you approach these issues by collaboration? And I think, again, this is key. And again, I think business has a responsibility to be out there on the front foot, taking this forward rather than waiting for somebody else to do it for them. And again, we need to set the ground rules in as many ways as we can so that we can actually guide as business the documents that emerge and the conversations that occur. Because of course, what we're looking to do in the resolution is scaling up of efforts. And that's collaboration again, to come back to Andrea's point. So the paper that's been drafted so far starts to explore some of that with regards to what business can do through its organizations. And that means information sharing, and this is beginning now, but it needs to happen very much at the national level as well, because as I said at the outset, national governments may move in different ways. So the more guidance that can be made from the IOE of a collaborative, constant approach will be very, very important. And again, most importantly, both the IOE within its multilateral engagement, but companies at the national level through their employer organizations is to engage with governments. And I think, again, there is a real risk that if national employer organizations are not actually picking up this ball and running with it, as we do in New Zealand rugby, there's a real chance that others will pick up the ball and run in a different direction. And that can be dis, dif, dif, you know, detrimental to us over time. The IOE, as I said, is already looking to engage, and this is another example of that. But this paper is very much a first attempt. It's not the final word. This is going to continue to change and morph over time. And it's very, very important that business keeps up to date with what is going on and pivots where it needs to in order to address the changes where they occur. So I'm going to stop there, Matthias, because I know we've got some other excellent speakers to join us this morning. And so I'd like to thank again Cass and IOE for the opportunity to participate. And I'll hand over back to you, Matthias. Thank you, Brendan. At this moment, my dog starts to bark. Perfect timing. But um, anyway, we take the ball, as you say, in New Zealand rugby, although in Germany, we're extremely bad in rugby, I must admit. We also have extremely bad in soccer, as we just saw in Qatar. I'm not sure what we are good in to starting. But anyway, it's a different question. Perhaps Andrea can elaborate. We have now really an excellent panel. We are running against time, but if you have any question, any comment, please use the chat function, please use the Q&A, and we will make this question, we address them in between. So really this is interactive and we will, we want to learn from you, we want to hear from you. So please use the chat function and the Q&A. With that, I would like to turn it over to Susanne Spears. She is an international lawyer, she is, a key expert when it comes to also the question about the impact of the resolution with regards to the different regimes and what does it mean actually for companies. So we're really great. I'm muted. No, I'm not muted. I'm irritated. We can hear you. <laughs> so I hope you hear me. So anyway, I'm over to you, Susanne, for um, giving your perspective. What does this UN and General Assembly resolution mean for companies? Terrific. Thank you so much, Matthias. Um, and I won't go into rugby discussions, but I could because despite my accent, my household um, is uh, are avid rugby fans and players. At any event, um, I wanted to talk to the fact that, of course, the UNGPs call upon companies to respect all internationally recognized human rights. And therefore, international human rights law really sets the benchmark against which other social actors will judge um, corporate activity. So it's clearly very important for, um, for the organizations involved in this um, seminar and companies generally to take note when a new international human rights norm has um, emerged or is evolving. Um, and doing so will not only enable companies to align their due diligence um, and their respect for human rights with that norm, but also anticipate where domestic legal systems may be going, um, and indeed at the international or transnational level as well with respect to such a norm. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of the overview from the perspective of an international lawyer. I don't know if anyone who follows me in this panel is an international lawyer, but I'm assuming by your introduction, Matthias, that this is what you'd like me to do. So 
I'll just set a little bit of the background to the right to a healthy environment in the five minutes that I have. Um, I think we should take note of the fact that really throughout the 1990s in the first decade of the 21st century, we really had this sort of schizophrenia um, phenomenon going on with domestic legal systems really progressively developing the linkages between the right, um, human rights and environmental rights. And indeed 155 constitutions around the world already recognize um, the right to a healthy environment in some, in some form or another. So we had this going on at the domestic level, but at the international level, rather oddly, we had things going in the opposite direction. We had many powerful states resisting the idea, at least de facto, perhaps not always expressly, but um, they resisted the idea that the protection of human rights and the environment should be intertwined. They really wanted these rights to remain separate. Now, why was this the case? Well, first, countries in the global south were very keen to balance environmental concerns with what they viewed as their overriding uh, determination to uh, pursue socioeconomic development. Um, and by contrast, countries in the global north, who were well aware that their socioeconomic development had really taken place at the expense of the environment, and you could say in some cases at the expense of human rights, they in fact did not want to accept that they had any historic responsibility or obligation to assist the global south to develop in a different way. So we found uh, the United States and other countries resistant at the international level that there should be a recognized human right to a healthy environment. And in particular, with respect to trans transnational or cross-border environmental harm, in other words, climate change, because that could, in, again, imply some sort of historic responsibility on um, uh, environmentally damaging states. So that was the background. But I think what we've seen in, in parallel is a real greening of other human rights, um, international human rights tribunals, uh, the UN, the Office for the High Commissioner for Human Rights, all have increasingly pointed to the fact that um, climate change as well as environmental damage um, does have an inextricable link to international human rights, that a healthy environment is necessary for the full enjoyment of human rights, and conversely, the exercise of human rights, including some procedural rights, such as rights to information, participation, and remedy, are critical to environmental protection. So this linkage has been recognized, and, and perhaps the highest profile acknowledgement was in the preamble of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change in 2015, where the preamble does recognize um, the interrelationship. Now, just to say and follow on Brett's excellent comments, what is the legal significance of the recent UN General Assembly resolution recognizing the right to a healthy environment? And this follows on a similar resolution by the Human Rights Council the year before. Um, as a preliminary matter, we should note that the UN General Assembly, which is an organ of an international organization, generally does not have the capacity to make international law. However, uh, resolutions of the UN General Assembly may in some instances constitute evidence of the existence of customary international law. Um, they may help crystallize emerging customary international law, or they may contribute to the formation of new customary international law. Now, this isn't to say that the General Assembly resolution is not without import. It's simply to, to explain that I don't think that, um, and, and judging by the objections that were raised, it necessarily um, constitutes um, a, new, uh, a new customary norm at this point. Um, in fact, we saw some very strange bedfellows in the resistance to the resolution. We saw abstentions by the likes of China and Russia. And then we saw the US and the UK who did vote for the resolution, nonetheless register their um, understandings that there was not a clear um, customary international norm of a right to a healthy environment yet at this point. Um, the UK's concern was that the right could potentially remain somewhat um, amorphous and hard to define. Um, and that in fact, um, this would create legal uncertainty both for states as well as for um, companies. Um, however, we should take into account that at the same time, there has been increasing um, jurisprudence 
from other sources that are defining this right um, and, and developing it. And so I think what we should see the UN General Assembly resolution really as rather than a capstone of an evolution um, of, a, of the right, rather a cornerstone of its evolution. In other words, the, the contours of the right will emerge on the basis of this General Assembly resolution. It'll be more of an impetus for further development. Um, and I'll just, um, I think I'm coming up on my five minutes. So I'm <laughs> Matthias will nod at me when I'm at my five minutes. Okay, okay. Um, I'll just say that um, we should take into account the context um, at the same time as we had, or not long after the General Assembly resolution, we also had a finding by the UN Human Rights Committee in a case against Australia by the indigenous people of the Torres Strait Islands um, with respect to climate change. And I note that um, the Human Rights Committee found that indeed Australia had violated Article 17, which is on non-arbitrary interference with privacy, family life and home, and Articles 27, which is about minority rights to culture of the ICCPR in failing to protect the Torres Strait Islanders from the ravages of climate change. Um, and the committee, uh, instructed Australia to meaningfully engage and also to pay compensation to uh, the Torres Strait Islanders. Now, this is significant because, again, it shows that potentially these are rights that are justiciable. They are rights that could indeed um, implicate international human rights um, treaties, um, and therefore um, this could have significant consequences, not only for states, but Again, for companies, if we take into account the UNGPs tell us that companies need to be doing due diligence and respecting all internationally uh, recognized human rights. Um, I think I'll stop there. Matthias will say whether I should stop there. Yes, no. <laughs> okay. Um, and I, I believe others are going to go on to what does it mean in practical terms um, for companies, something I'm very happy to talk about, but not in my five minutes. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Suzanne. That was extremely helpful and it gives really the law perspective on this topic because there we receive a lot of questions by company. What does this actually mean for me as a company? So really appreciate that. Now we're going to the perspective of a federation, Andy, who represents small and medium-sized companies and who wants to know, or we want to know from you, Camilla, uh, what does it actually mean? What can employers federation, what can business organization do to support their member companies to address this question? So Maria Camilla Agudelo, she is a public affairs director from Andy, our member in Colombia. Over to you. Thank you, Matthias. And thank you to the IOE and the CAS Foundation for the invitation. Uh, greetings to all. I'm going to switch to Spanish if that's OK. So. Uh, Ok, bueno, muchas gracias a la Organización Internacional de Empleadores y a la Fundación CAS por la, invita por la invitación. Yo quería comenzar con algo que pasó hace poco en Colombia. Una empresa cuya energía proviene en un 90% de centrales eléctricas, de centrales hidroeléctricas que se alimentan con carbón, eh, decidieron diversificar estas fuentes de energía para responder a los compromisos de descarbonización. Esta decisión de la empresa tuvo un efecto muy grande en su principal proveedor, quien ante la finalización de este contrato tuvo que despedir a más del 70% de sus trabajadores sin previo aviso. Yo comienzo con esto solo para mostrar los retos que tenemos en el tema de cambio climático. Sabemos que debemos actuar ya y las empresas tienen un compromiso y, y un interés cada vez mayor en estos temas, pero también sabemos que debemos hacerlo con una transición tanto en la práctica como en el marco legal, que ya de tanto pues hemos hablado. Como Andrea eh, dijo en la introducción, no es un proceso fácil, pero a su vez es un proceso que puede tener muchos beneficios. Ustedes saben que el cambio climático está magnificando las desigualdades y las vulnerabilidades de las comunidades y por eso el respeto y la promoción de los derechos humanos en, el, en este tema se vuelve aún más urgente. Las empresas y el sector privado tienen un compromiso muy grande con este tema y en general con la conducta empresarial responsable. 
y una de las prioridades, digamos, más importantes es avanzar en la implementación de los compromisos del, del Acuerdo de París y de la Conferencia de Naciones Unidas sobre Cambio Climático, la COP26. Eh, ¿Cómo hacen esto las empresas? Esto es posible solo llevando a cabo una debida diligencia como lo establecen los principios rectores de empresas y derechos humanos de Naciones Unidas, es decir, identificando, evitando, mitigando y reparando los posibles daños o estos impactos adversos que se puedan generar en relación pues, con el cambio climático. Acá particularmente en Colombia tenemos una, una iniciativa que se puede replicar en otros países que se llama Guías Colombia. Esto es una eh, plataforma multiactor, acá hacen parte centrales sindicales, organizaciones de la sociedad civil, empresas, eh, autoridades públicas, o sea, el gobierno. Y lo que hacemos es que nos reunimos para sacar unas guías y en este, eh, en este año y específicamente esta última guía nos hemos dedicado a una guía en cambio climático. Entonces, eh, ¿qué buscamos con esta guía de cambio climático? Que todas las empresas, sin importar su tamaño, naturaleza o sector, puedan actuar con la debida diligencia en derechos humanos en el contexto de cambio climático. Es decir, que ellos tengan una guía de cómo deben actuar porque muchas veces y lo que hemos encontrado haciendo esta guía es que muchas empresas tienen digamos acciones de cambio climático o, o acción climática pero al no tener un panorama o, o, o una guía como tal de actuación pueden estar cometiendo incluso eh, efectos adversos o generando efectos adversos también tenemos un proyecto con la industria danesa es un proyecto en el tema de transición justa y lo que estamos trabajando es con empresas afiliadas a la ANTI, que es la organización a la que yo hago parte, estamos haciendo un, unos encuentros con las empresas para que ellos puedan aprender todo el proceso de reducción de huella de carbono, casi que para que sus empresas lleguen a ser carbono neutro. Y también lo mismo, pero con huella hídrica, con huella de agua. A su vez, en Colombia también estamos trabajando el tema de la transición energética. En Colombia hay zonas, por ejemplo, la zona de La Guajira, que es en la esquina del país, es una zona que tiene mucha presencia de comunidades indígenas y hay empresas que están trabajando con energías limpias, que se están asentando en esta región, pero que no saben cómo tener ese relacionamiento con las comunidades, especialmente con las comunidades indígenas. Entonces estamos trabajando, por ejemplo, en una guía de debida diligencia para el relacionamiento con comunidades. Para ir, digamos, concluyendo, ¿qué es súper importante? Integrar los derechos humanos en las estrategias corporativas de cambio climático y para esto es necesario el diálogo y la participación entre las empresas, el Estado, los trabajadores y, por supuesto, las comunidades. Es importante mitigar reduciendo los efectos de cambio climático y esto se puede lograr con estrategias como medición y reducción de gases de efecto invernadero o con eh, capturas de carbono, por ejemplo. También es súper necesaria la adaptación para reducir la vulnerabilidad que tienen las personas con el cambio climático o los ecosistemas y también los activos de las empresas frente al cambio climático. Ejemplo de esto se puede llevar con la conservación y la reforestación. Por ejemplo, en Colombia es súper importante el tema de reforestación porque acá tenemos un problema de tala ilegal de árboles muy grande que incluso es más... Pues es el problema más grande que tenemos en cambio climático en este momento. Y por último, es súper importante la transición con el objetivo de adoptar progresivamente procesos, nuevas tecnologías, procesos de economía circular, de responsabilidad extendida de, del productor, etc. Para finalizar, también hemos visto que hay una creciente, un creciente aumento de los litigios ambientales y de derechos humanos. Solo el año pasado tuvimos más de 112 litigios de derechos humanos, 83% de ellos contra gobiernos y 17% contra empresas. Por eso es tan importante dar a conocer este tema y que no solo las empresas, sino los gobiernos y la sociedad civil, todos podamos aportar y podamos llevar a cabo estrategias conjuntas. También vemos, digamos, todos los estándares internacionales, que es lo último que quería mencionar, la adopción el año pasado de la resolución de la Asamblea General de las Naciones Unidas, que declaró el acceso a un ambiente sano como un derecho fundamental universal, 
También el actual, eh, la actual revisión de las guías de empresas multinacionales de la OPTE, que también la estamos viendo, digamos, con mucha atención. Y, por supuesto, la directiva de debida diligencia de la Unión Europea. En Colombia, solo para comentarles, la discusión va más allá. Acá, por ejemplo, lo que se ha buscado eh, por parte del Congreso es declarar el medio ambiente como sujetos de derechos. O sea, ya no hablar solo de las personas, sino del medio ambiente como tal. Declarar, por ejemplo, que un río tiene derecho. Eh, y esto, digamos, que se está volviendo ya un tema de la propia Constitución. Entonces, cierro con esto solo para enviar el mensaje de que el tema legal es muy importante, pero hay que revisar si sí si es oportuno, o sea, si las pequeñas, sobre todo las pequeñas y las medianas empresas pueden, digamos, soportar una carga legal de este tipo, que lo que puede hacer es frenar todos los procesos que se están haciendo con las organizaciones de la sociedad civil, Thank con you. los gobiernos y con las demás entidades. Thank Gracias. you so much, Maria. That was really helpful to get the perspective from Andy, from Colombia. That was great. We have two questions. One is, what does NCP means? National contact points and national contact points are the key um, contact points as a place for the OECD guidelines in the OECD countries and countries which are here to the OECD guidelines. And when stakeholders have a complaint against uh, or a grievance against the company where they believe they are violating the guidelines, they can contact the national contact points and they start in a mediation. There's another question which um, is um, about what can companies exactly do with regards to addressing climate change and human rights. And I'm very happy to have our next speaker who can address this question because Noreen Kennedy is really the key expert when it comes to everything linked to climate change. She attended, I guess, every one of the COPs, starting with COP1 to COP27 now. She is really a key pillar. She is a senior vice president of the US Council of International Business. And we are really grateful for getting your expertise, particularly when it comes about climate change and all issues related to the Paris Agreement. Noreen, if you, in your response, can you also address a question which was asked what companies should do? Over to you, Noreen. Yeah, thank you, Matthias. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to the other speakers for uh, really important points. Um, maybe the first thing I, I want to say is that from a very high level for USCIB, for my organization, We have more question than, questions than answers at the moment concerning the uh, UN General Assembly uh, right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. We're just beginning to unpack the significance of, of, of this uh, resolution, I guess, like others. And, and clearly, climate change is going to be a very important piece of it, but not the only piece. I mean, I think one thing that we just have to recognize from the very beginning is that the the United Nations, the multilateral system, the international community, we're all facing and dealing with what is being called a triple planetary crisis, um, which concerns not only climate change, but also loss of biodiversity, plastics, and other kinds of pollution. All of those things are linked together and then need to be seen in the broader context of the sustainable development goals. So when we talk about clean, healthy, sustainable environment, it means climate change, but it doesn't mean only climate change. Uh, one of the previous speakers talked about the uh, explanations of position filed by key countries, so I won't restate that. Um, and perhaps there are other different interpretations among other countries that chose not to publish them publicly. But I guess the takeaway from that for USCIB is that if the governments haven't yet achieved a meeting of their collective minds as to the scope, um, Does it make sense already for business to, to start to think about what the scope should be from our own standpoint? Uh, I'm glad to see that IOE has, is starting out to do that. That's certainly what we're uh, doing at USCIB. Um, what is covered here? Who defines the coverage? And how do we resolve outstanding differences of view, which there certainly are? And then the third point is that in the environmental arena, There are plethoras upon plethoras of regulations uh, at municipal, state, federal, and international level, on top of which come standards, ESG, codes, and responsible business practices when it comes to environment and what constitutes a clean, healthy, sustainable environment in different jurisdictions. Um, it is said that in the United States, there are more pages of environmental code, i.e. governmental rules, than for taxation. And by and large, those environmental regulations, at least in an ideal world, 
um, are built on scientific assessment management of risk. So now a question that faces our companies is to what, how many of these regulations um, that exist in so many places are to be accepted a priori as a reflection of the government having taken into account the human rights of their citizens to a clean and healthy, sustainable environment. Um, if a constituency comes forward to challenge such a governmental environmental regulation is not adequately respectful, what is the appropriate business response? There are a lot of hypothetical challenging spaces that we have to sort out. And so the bottom line is that this right does have to fit into a very crowded and complex space in which we see a lot of dynamic change and even competition for the upper hand. Um, when it comes to climate change, for example, who does have the ultimate authority for climate change? Uh, as as Matias said, we have 27 years and, and beyond of, of um, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which considers itself to be the authoritative arbiter of, of what's appropriate to be done at the, in the international community on climate change. What if there are different perspectives and, and different roles? And how do trade-offs fit into what is uh, an inextricably part of policy making. How does that all fit in? So in terms of what are advising our members, the short answer is, first of all, the fundamentals continue to apply with respect to the UNGPs. Those don't change. And secondly, the, the business commitment and priority on protecting the environment and urgently addressing the climate crisis still is as strong, if not stronger than ever, as well as for other you know, environmental areas. But to close, it is clear that at this moment, it's still very early days. The foundation is just being laid. Governments have much more work to do to define the scope of the right. There are different views of what that scope should be. We clearly have to bring stakeholders together to clarify and achieve a meeting of minds. Uh, as business, we need policy coherence. And um, as much as possible, the recognition of relative specific authorities of certain frameworks. As mentioned before, um, I'm at the UN Convention on Biological Diversity right now, their negotiations, they certainly feel that they themselves are in a position to define what constitutes a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Um, and so I think we, we definitely will have some different voices and different processes that have to converge. But within USCIB, we clearly have more work to do, which we look forward to doing with IOE. Uh, to try to find the correct balance, the correct shared responsibility, and work within our government obligations and through voluntary initiatives to do what private sector needs to do to provide for a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. So I'll stop there. And thanks again, Matthias. No, thank you, Noreen. And thank you also for all the exp expertise you provide to us in this topic, because that is really, you know, you are a pillar of wisdom, I must say, on this regard, and we really rely on all of that. So thank you for that. And also to really, you know, outline that it is more than climate change, right? Um, this topic, it's not only, we all automatically focus on climate change, but it is, of course, much broader when you look at the UN General Assembly resolution, and that's, that's important. There's one comment in the chat, and perhaps the next speaker can address this also, whether it's helpful to address climate change with a human rights lens. That is a question, there's a question mark, and I'm more than happy that I don't have to answer that, but perhaps the next speaker, which is who is Clentiana Mat uh, Mamutai, thank you so much for joining us. You are the UN Chair Rapporteur of the Expert Mechanism on the Right to Development. It's a long title. Um, we really appreciate that you are here this evening with us to give us your perspective, and perhaps you can also directly address this question, you know. Is it really helpful to address climate change policy through human rights lens? Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, just a quick um, and and slight correction. Um, I'm not the chair rapporteur at, at this stage. We rotate the chairmanship of the group, and at this point in time, I'm not the chair. Ah, but sorry, I am it. still no, no, not not a problem. I just don't want to step on the on the toes of my my uh, fellow experts. But uh, ah, I am a member. You start of a revolution here. You we make you <laughs> as a chair now. You know, we crown you as a chair. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the question is very interesting, and in fact, I was going to uh, look at this problem exactly on the relationship between human rights, climate change, and international investment law, because I think that's where the real tension really lies. Uh, we talk a great deal about directives, about resolutions, uh, and it's it's great. There are great developments, but when things go wrong, um, 
investors sue states and they go back to the international uh, investment agreements, which are the legally binding instruments. And then we find ourselves in a difficult position as we have, for example, with all the turmoil that surrounds the uh, claims under the uh, Energy Charter Treaty, um, as well as the various attempts for its reform. So I think it's quite a, a timely conversation to have. Um, now, insofar as uh, the tension um, is concerned, there is clearly a tension between states' obligations to investors on the one hand and the obligations on climate change on the other. And it seems to me that a rights-based approach is essential in trying to strike a positive relationship between investment and climate goals. And as I mentioned, uh, directives and resolutions are all very uh, useful, but um, the agreements are the legally binding instruments, and those are the uh, documents that determine uh, the outcome when things uh, go wrong. But even before we get to uh, dispute settlement, uh, when the relationship between a state and investor and a community um, uh, collapses, uh, even before we get there, from the business point of view, uh, research shows that companies uh, value treaty-based protection for investors, uh, the availability of investor state dispute settlement, and the host state's history of involvement in investor state disputes, all of which strongly influence uh, the business's decisions, the investors' decisions to make the investment or not. So it is beneficial to look at this from, from both the states and, uh, and the human rights point of view, but also from the business uh, point of view. So it seems to me that the question that arises here is how to use these international investment agreements as a vehicle to advance the climate goals and mitigate the current obstacles that those agreements currently present. So here are some suggestions. Um, we can do this first by removing investment treaty protection from fossil fuel investors. Now that's a really hard sell and very, very difficult to achieve in practice. But secondly, and perhaps more optimistically, by including climate um, FDI, uh, foreign direct investment provisions, in international investment agreements. Uh, and those provisions would help to protect, promote, facilitate, or otherwise support FDI that helps lower carbon, is carbon neutral, or is carbon negative. But in order to stimulate climate FDI, obviously clarity and coherence are necessary. And perhaps we can start with a common definition, and lawyers love definitions, and these instruments will need clear uh, consolidated definitions, which at the moment, in fact, are, are missing, and, and those divergences and on the definition in itself need to be ironed out. Uh, it seems to me that changes to legally binding instruments, bearing in mind that a lot of the new generation investment agreements contain a lot of provisions on human rights and sustainable development, and some of them on climate change as well, uh, all these changes, though, um, all the necess necessary changes that we need in order to properly tackle uh, the climate situation, take a lot of time to come to fruition. And I personally have my reservations on whether these changes will happen at the necessary pace. Uh, and that leads me to the next question. In the meantime, what can we do to deploy soft law instruments to support the existing international investment law system? And, and here I, I come up with some suggestions and obviously I don't have time to, to elaborate those, so they're very much uh, in, in bullet point form. But first of all, um, expanding the interpretation of states regulatory space within these international investment agreements in order to reflect the recently adopted UN resolution, and I, I take on board all that uh, what Susanna said about um, its nature and the fact that it's not a binding instrument, but I still think that um, this resolution, which recognizes the human right to clean and healthy environment, can be helpful when interpreting existing uh, international investment agreements and the state's regulatory space to accommodate human rights and climate goals within uh, those regulatory frameworks. So, I mean, I, I don't know, uh, only time will tell whether I'm right in, in, in this um, prediction, 
Uh, but I think it's a positive uh, development to that extent. Um, it comes with a big caveat, uh, as it was mentioned earlier, a few countries did abstain and China, India, Russia and Japan all abstained. It may or may not be a coincidence that those are all big fossil fuel producers. Um, a second a way of tackling um, the issue of um, human rights, climate and investment is to look at the Paris Agreement itself. Now, the Paris Agreement expressly refers to the rights, uh, to the right of uh, to development in its preamble. And, and it seems to me that it is not controversial that a human rights based approach, uh, when considering the admission of foreign uh, direct investment, is a must. And this can be done through scrutinizing, amongst others, the climate value of a prospective investment. And, and that can be done through the consultation and participation of communities in which the investment uh, is made uh, to operate. And third, and building on my previous uh, suggestion, community participation, in my view, this is my personal opinion, uh, should include the use of social licenses to operate. Now, um, this is a means through which the affected community gives climate approval to the foreign investment um, investor. So this is a license that would support but also scrutinize the investment throughout its operational life, rather than it being a one-off requirement at the beginning of the project. So effective social licenses to operate are essential to the right of participation into the economic, social, and cultural development of local communities, also permitting those communities to benefit directly uh, from this process. And fourth, uh, and again, these are entirely my opinions, personal opinions, alongside the SLOs, there should be in place uh, a non-judicial compliance mechanism, which can deal with um, any disputes or any complaints in a non-adversarial way, uh, and can deal with those uh, disputes and complaints between an investor and the community, um, throughout the operational life of a particular investment. And, and last but not least, um, environmental and social impact statements uh, in the context of human rights protection have found a way in international uh, investment agreements. Um, and those are great uh, statements and, and a great step, a step forward insofar as human rights protection with these, the, within the universe of international investment law is concerned. But in my view, they are not sufficient. And I think time is now to have this climate assessments as part and parcel of this packet as well for an effective way of approaching climate, human rights and investment in a multi-stakeholder human rights approach. Thank you. I don't no, know I over, over. No, you're not over, it's perfect. Thank you so much. And actually I would love to bring Suzanne and Noreen back to this conversation on that. But um, first of all, we would like to hear from Sandy Shong. Sandy Shong, you are founder of Verity Consulting. Um, so you come from the Asian background. Um, we already spoke about some of the Asian countries. It would be great to get your perspective. You know, what are the challenges, how we can support companies and what is your view about the impact of this UNGA resolution? Sandy, over to you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity. So my background was in academia and um, currently I help Singaporean companies or Singapore-based international companies uh, to expand internationally or regionally. So some of the companies would also include Swiss companies or German companies that are in basically in Singapore and wanting to enter the Asian market, which means they're gonna have uh, footprints in, in Asia. So when it comes to investment, like um, uh, the, the former speaker, uh, Kletiana mentioned about, um, it is very essential, obviously, to have that dialogue, um, to operate uh, socially, to have that social license to operate, but more importantly, just to give everyone a context with regards to the situation in Asia. So um, about 57 million people in Asia are affected by climate disaster. And this is uh, estimated in 2021. And this is according to the International Federation of Red Cross. Um, and the reason is also because there are more people in Asia living in the coastal area. So when it comes to climate change, the rise of sea level, and also severe weather, 
Asian countries are going to be impacted hugely. Everyone is saying that uh, the next the next Asian century is coming. A lot of economy, a, a lot of economic activity is going to happen in Asia. Population is going to rise up just outside China, uh, just the Southeast Asian country. We're looking at 700. 50 million people. So everything is burgeoning, everything is growing. So it's very exciting, not just for Asia, but also for European countries and also uh, American investors. Um, the issue is if we do not do something about this climate issue, then we will be looking at a decline in this growth and also not just the degradation of the livelihood, but also the degradation of the standard of living in Southeast Asia. Um, and of course, uh, more importantly, uh, most of the indigenous people in the world, about two thirds of them actually live in Asia Pacific region. So that's about 250 million lives being affected. So I was born in Singapore and I'm based in Australia and I fly between two countries and I totally can understand about what Suzanne was talking about with regards to um, Australia now being held accountable <laughs> for the indigenous people. Um, and I think that's really important. I guess, I guess we've my experience dealing with clients, either Singapore-based or uh, Singaporean companies or even Asian companies, is that they have to weigh against risk and opportunities. Those are the two issues that they are facing at the moment with small and medium-sized enterprises, particularly small and medium-sized. Um, there are transitional risk and there are also physical risk. So physical risk, the only way you can do it is through mitigation. Hopefully you have good advice and good insurance policies, but otherwise um, it's quite a challenging experience to try and transform uh, and transition uh, your, your business. So we have a client, for example, in Singapore, they have 6,000 fleets of buses. They want to electrify it. Um, the problem is, there's no infrastructure to do that. And they need to lobby the government to do that. Um, we have also other clients who wanted to basically be more responsible as a employer and also as a business owner in the cacao supply chain. Um, again, um, transitioning to get the, those certification and so on do have risk. And the issue is where are the opportunities? And I think a lot of policy makers and banks are doing their best to try and help these businesses but they also need to understand that a lot of businesses currently in Asia Pacific region are in the pre-compliance and compliance stage. So they have yet to go into fully integrated or transformative or innovative stage. So those are just some of the challenges that people need to recognize. And of course, when you talk about challenges, you have external and internal challenges. So the external challenges are what SMEs could not control. And sometimes they can lobby, they can organize, but essentially things like government regulation, tax incentives or tax regulation, or even lending practices. So I've given a talk in, in, in Singapore with some of the banks based saying, look, we need to help companies transition. But number one, we do not have the expertise to judge or to assess which of these businesses are going to be risk-free or going to um, make a return of investment. Uh, number two, they don't have the knowledge and the expertise to basically figure out the codes and standards because different regions have different uh, regulations and different standards. So uh, a lot of companies then say, well, if that's the case, uh, I'm just going to fund, um, this includes fund managers, include foreign investors, I'm just gonna fund pure play not transition in business. So the, the, the ones who are trying to transition are facing a lot of issues. Um, so uh, the other internal challenges that small and medium-sized enterprises are facing currently are internal. So the lack of funding is one thing, as I mentioned before, time, um, trying to get their employees to have that buy-in um, strategy. What do you do next? Where do you start? Uh, lack of expertise, knowledge gap in the trends as well. And for a lot of Small and medium-sized enterprises in Southeast Asia, um, there is, they're still trying to struggle with creating this corporate culture where this is a conversation we need to have now. How can we transition our employees into more climate conscious? How can we get their buy-in? Because after all, they are on the front line. So they can feed back to the companies and say, we need to change this in our supply chain or we need to change this in our operation. So getting them 
um, getting them aware, getting them to this level of awareness is, is a challenge for a lot of companies. And of course, um, after you've decided that you wanted to implement all these changes, there's also a lack of vendor options within your supply chain, right? So which of these uh, vendors can help me to transition? How can I reduce my footprint along the way when I'm distributing or when I'm producing these products? So some, some of the solutions uh, could also include collaboration, consulting your customers, consulting your vendors um, and, and looking into those things. And of course, currently, like everywhere in the world, ESG is big. So a lot of public listed companies wanted to communicate these changes to not just their shareholders, but also their customers. Small, medium-sized enterprises who are trying to attract capital, for example, you know, some mining companies in Australia, meat cap or small cap, they're trying to communicate this and educate this to their shareholders, why it is so important to invest in them. Um, and so that, those are just some of the big challenges that um, SMEs are following, following and of course, education as well. So I'm more than happy to share the solution later on and what governments can do, but I'm sure um, Matthias uh, have, have some comments to make. Thank you. Thank you very now, much. Thank you so much, Sandy. That was extremely helpful. And you know, this is a problem. We're running always against time and pr probably we have should have made it just longer because this is such a rich debate <laughs> and I really would have loved to go back to all the people on all these conversations. Um, I can only promise you, we will, it will not be the last conversation, we will continue that. There are many opportunities actually to bring people together on that. I just want to go quickly back to brand. Um, brand, I'm sorry for the background noise. Um, quickly go back to brand, you know, what you make out of all of that. I'm so happy that it's not me who is actually drafting the second guidance. So um, over to you, Brand, for two minutes and then um, over to Andrea. Brand. No, thank you, Matthias, and thank you, everyone, for your input. Look, as I said at the outset, this is very first attempt to try and put something down to start the process of guidance. Uh, as everyone has mentioned in their comments, this cuts across so many areas. And I think Sandy's point about the usability and feasibility of advice to the SME sector is particularly important, given the large preponderance of companies that fall within that definition. So whatever advice we can give is going to have to also look at this through a lens not just of the large multinationals who have the resources knowledge and experience to probably get ahead of this quicker than others but also to think about the voice of the smes which is where again as i said in my opening comments the role of the ioe at the international level to to shepherd together a voice which helps bring those different lenses to this debate will be important so I appreciate very much all of your comments with regards to where we're going with this. If you have other comments you'd like to share on the paper, please do not hesitate to get them to Matthias so that we can at least get the first tranche of information and guidance out there, recognizing, as everyone has said, that this is a crowded marketplace in terms of issues facing business, but also this is very nascent in the way in which countries are actually looking to address these challenges, let alone companies. So thank you, Matthias. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And particular thank you to Jason, Jason Pegat. Jason Pegat is leading our work on business and human rights. Um, I don't know. Do you have your camera on? I can't see you at the moment, Jason. Perhaps you can just say something so everyone can see you um, for all your work you have done. And thank you to Monique, Monique de Pierre, who is bringing us together and who is really, you know, the key producing master here for these webinars. So thank you, Jason. Thank you, Monique. Mm -hmm. And over to you, Andrea, for the last word. Thank you for the interpreters. And thank you for the interpreters. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, My well, Spanish I... is a bit rusty. Over <laughs> to you, Andrea. Um, I think I can only echo um, the kind of... Yeah, a very rich um, debate that we had, and 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 Brent highlighted that there is a need um, also to to give business a proactive voice, and and really uh, at a time when the interpretation also um, of the resolution by member states is is still quite vague. I think one has to one has to venture into this um, space and and really also communicate the needs um, and the kind of 
perspective of, of the private sector um, early on and try to shape the interpretation. Um, but I was also thinking that definitely we should continue the discussions on that topic, but perhaps we should also next time bring in a governmental uh, perspective. Um, also to see a little bit, okay, what is their take and, and how do they perceive also the, the concerns um, by, by business and what do they want to do about it? So I think uh, we definitely should continue and I hope, Matthias, we can continue this discussion in the new year. Thank you so much for everything and uh, to everybody for your expertise that you shared with us today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.